So good morning, everyone, guys. So hope you're doing great and the preparation is going on at um, extraordinarily good pace. So in the, for the next one hour, we will be discussing about the NEET PG previous year questions from anesthesia. Okay, so let's uh, start with this. While doing lumbar puncture, the first question, while doing lumbar puncture, which is the last structure to be encountered? Ligamentum flavum, dura mater, carotenoid membrane, pia mater. Come on, guys. Answer, type in the chat box. Very good. Arachnoid membrane. You see this, the structures, what are the structures peers in the sequence? Like spinal anesthesia, the structures peers the skin, subcutaneous tissue, supraspinous ligament, interspinous ligament, ligamentum flavum, dura mater, and arachnoid membrane. Okay, so the last structure to be pierced is the arachnoid membrane here. So don't get carried away by seeing this pia matter and um, doing this. So the last structure being pierced here is the answer, the correct answer here is arachnoid membrane. Suppose if it is in the same question, if similarly if they ask in epidural, what is the last structure pierced? They ask in epidural, last structure pierced. What is the answer? Yes, very good. Then it's going to be ligamentum flavum. In here, the drug is basically inserted between, in epidural, the drug is usually inserted between ligamentum flavum and dura mater. In here, the drug is deposited here in spinal and between ligamentum and dura mater. Here, epidural drug is being inserted. So what are the needle here itself? We'll discuss two important points. Like what are the what are the needles used? For spinal anesthesia, the needles used are usually twinky, sprotty, and vitacker. For epidural, we usually use too high. Here it is 18 gauge. Here, somewhere between 25 gauge to 27 gauge, you use and most commonly used is 26 gauge. Okay, so this is important. And another important point here, I just want to um, want you to remember is the most common complication which occurs intraoperatively with spinal anesthesia. And what is the most common complication post-operatively? Most common complication intraoperatively following spinal anesthesia is, come on guys, answer. What is this? Very good. It is hypotension. It is hypotension. Whereas post-operatively, it is urinary retention urinary retention and remember don't get carried away by answering it is like a headache headache is not the most common complication but like it is most worrisome so what is the another pdph or post ural puncture headache how can you identify it is most commonly over mainly usually happens after 12 to 24 hours after spinal anesthesia sometimes even 24 to 48 hours after spinal anesthesia and in most properties the characteristics start in the occipital and then extend into the frontal and pdph how do you usually treat the first line management being first line give adequate IV or oral fluids before that allow bed rest IV or oral analgesics and you can give caffeine. The second line you can use abdominal binders 
carbon dioxide inhalation okay and uh, you can use even give trip tans but remember the most important is the third line of definitive treatment is a definitive treatment is epidural blood patch autologous epidural blood patch okay. these are the things i want you to remember when we discuss about the um, spinal anesthesia then coming to second question a patient is undergoing surgery where anesthesia is maintained with halothane. Intraoperatively, the patient developed muscle rigidity and severe hyperthermia. Which of the following agent would also have contributed to this condition? Deutubicularia, cisatracurium, succinylcholine, procuronium. What is the answer? What is the diagnosis first of all? What is the diagnosis? Patient is undergoing intraoperatively surgery where like he's maintained an halothane. Very good, very good. The answer is the diagnosis here is malignant hyperthermia. And this is a straightforward question, which is which indicates the most common drug. Most common drug causing malignant hyperthermia is sex polyp. Here, to add upon few points, malignant hyperthermia. Malignant hyperthermia is basically autosomal dominant. Acts through ranodin receptors. Chromosome 19. Okay. And before the temperature itself, like how you can easily identify is by seeing the mesotus spasm. Mesotus spasm is indicative. Usually you do by genetic testing. There are other tests like CHCT, caffeine halothane contracture test or IVCT, in vitro contracture test. Okay, so these are the things we do. And uh, this in this malignant hyperthermia patients, Malignant hyperthermia patients usually they uh, present with increased temperatures, cardiovascular collapse, cardiovascular instability, where you will be, and uh, respiratory and metabolic acidosis. Basically, all the things which occur due to increased metabolism and how you can characteristically, e you can see even in these patients like hyperkalemia, hypotension. Okay, tachycardia, all these things occur. What is the characteristic how you can identify in capnography? In capnography, you see characteristically rapid increase in ETCO2, where it can even go up to where it can even go up to more than 100 mmHg. This is very characteristic. And how do you treat? Treatment of malignant hyperthermia. So you do all the cooling measures. Remove the agents which cause this. Like succinylcholine. Mainly halothane. Okay. Remove these agents like whatever is there and all these things. And then most commonly use the drug of choice is Dantrolin sodium. Dantrolin sodium. Okay. So these are the things I want you to remember, particularly in relation with this malignant hyperthermia. Then a 32-year-old male patient was intubated for surgery. The best method to confirm the endotracheal tube position, chest x-ray, auscultation, capnography, chest expansion. Good. If I re if I reframe the question, a 32 year old male patient was intubated for surgery. The best method to confirm the uh, all of the following can be used to confirm the endotracheal tube positions, and I will give the options like if I rephrase the question as through which of the following methods a 
TTT position can be confirmed. Option A, 1, 2, 3. Option B, 2, 3, 4. Option C, 1, 3, 4. Option D, 1, 2, 3, 4. What is your answer? It should be D. So, all the chest X-ray, auscultation, capnography, chest expansion, though all the things can be answered. Here in this position, the best is being asked. So, capnography. Capnography is a, a gold standard. Capnography is gold standard to identify basically. So they, there are other methods like which we described like chest x-ray, auscultation, chest expansion and also there is a mist formation and there is an esophageal detector, there is a negative way of checking, all these things are there but most importantly we have to remember it is mainly the capnography. We will discuss about capnography in a short while when one of the questions was there. So capnography is the gold standard where you see normally Thirty-five to forty-five, thirty to forty will be there. So this is in controlled ventilation. This is in spontaneous ventilation. You see this waveforms. Okay, in capnography, in esophageal intubation, or if it is not there, you can't, you won't see this. Then, a young male was given regional anesthesia with zero point two five percent bupropion. The patient became unresponsive and pulse becomes unrecordable. What is the best management? CPCR with sodium bicarbonate, CPCR with 20% intralipid, CPCR with dobutamine, CPCR with calcium. Very, very, very important question. Very good. I'm very happy that all of you answered. The answer is 20% uh, intralipid. CPCR, cardiopulmonary cerebral resuscitation. What is the diagnosis here? What is the diagnosis here? It is lost. Local anesthetic. systemic toxicity okay so this is again an important topic which is becoming very popular nowadays like um, the questions like thrice this questions has asked, been asked in the last three years when compared with neat and inacid so local anesthetic systemic toxicity CNS and CVS can be involved. CNS is the first structure to be involved. Usually it involves paresthesia, convulsions and all. Usually managed with airway management mainly by securing the airway if needed intubation. If needed. And then you also give benzodiazepines. like metajolum then coming to cardiovascular sorry then coming to cardiovascular which is very 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 important is the most related bupiocaine is the most cardiotoxic it mainly causes ventricular arrhythmias okay for this, the treatment you use procainamide, amiodarone, and retilium. So this is for CVS, you can being the most cardiotoxic and ventricular arrhythmia is being used, the treatment being procainamide, amiodarone, and retilium. And also try to understand here, the cardiotoxicity which occurs you do cardiotoxicity which occurs due to bupropion toxicity is very difficult to revive very difficult to revive and the treatment for this is very important 20% intralipid emulsion or also called as formulation this is very, 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 very important point, like considering the recent trend of questions being asked. Okay, then coming to the following airway management procedure indicates manual inline stabilization, jaw thrust, 
head tilt and chin lift, head extension. Very good. Straightforward question. It is mostly very good. Head tilt. Here the head is being tilted and chin is being lifted. Head tilt and chin lift is the correct answer. So this is one of the components of the triple maneuver. Triple Usually for airway, for easier thing, triple maneuver will be there, which includes head tilt, chin lift, and jaw thrust. Jaw thrust, I'll show you in another image. So you know uh, what is being used, manual inline stabilization we have discussed, and in manual inline stabilization, manual inlaid stabilization usually a patient is lying down here so one anesthesiologist will be holding him with the head and another will be it one will be holding the head and another will be intubating this is manual inlaid stabilization there is also a question being asked the importance of manual the, the indication of manual inlaid stabilization is mainly in head injury patients so why do we do this triple maneuver in conditions of when there is a difficult airway, when to make things uh, easier, okay? Sorry. Here, like I mentioned, like it is mainly neck injury patients, sorry. Or cervical spine, right to cervical spine. Okay, so all the head injury patients like also rule out like the cervical spine fractures and before intubation. Okay, this is to learn further thing. Then here in head tilt, chin lift and jaw maneuver, which is called triple maneuver, like we have to be very careful. And like this is usually uh, done in conditions of difficult airway. And you know what is ideal position for intubation? Ideal position for intubation. Sniffing position or Michael's position or barking dog position, which is a flexion of cervical spine for 15 to 25 degrees, extension at Atlanto occipital joint for 75 to 85 degrees. Okay, these are the things which are very important and you have to remember next coming to the next question which of the following which of the following equipment is most commonly used during covid icus covid in icus non repeating mask simple face mask venturi mask and hudson mask it's fantastic very happy that like all of you answered correctly it is a non repeating mask which is a high high flow oxygen device which can de deliver oxygen up to 90 to 100% okay this is very, 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 very important. Okay. Particularly used in COVID when oxygenation is the most important thing. In type 1 respiratory failure, this helped a lot. Okay. Then simple face mask and Hudson mask are almost similar. It's just a slight modification with the Hudson, like where it delivers up to about 60%. And Venti mask is a again, it's a fixed performance device which it can divide, which it can deliver up to 60%. Through simple face mask, you can deliver up to 50 to 60 percentage. And also remember the nasal cannula at this point. Nasal cannula, which is delivered, the formula is 21 percentage plus 4 into flow rate. So the images of nasal cannula. Simple face mask also called a Hudson mask, then Venturi mask, non repeating mask, and another important thing, HFNC, high flow nasal cannula, HFNC. So the images of this are important, it's already given in your VSV and also as we are giving the the important points to be covered in the last few days. We are going to give these images also. So these things, the images of this and the flow rates are very important. Please remember this. Then, which of the following nerve is being monitored in the procedure shown below, where neuromuscular monitoring is being done? So very good. 
very good it is the ulnar now being monitored the most common is muscle adductor pollicis muscle supplied by ulnar now and most accurate is orbicularis oculi supplied by facial this neuromuscular monitoring is also very important then here what is the last structure to get paralyzed and first to recover after giving neuromuscular monitoring last to get paralyzed and first to recover very good diaphragm okay usually it is the, it starts with the facial muscles, neck, pharynx, larynx, jaw, respiratory muscles, small muscles, and last diaphragm. And in the sequence of recovery, the diaphragm is the first, and then start from the facial muscles and all. Okay. So the last structure to catalyze and first to recover is diaphragm is important point. Okay. And another important thing I want you to remember about this is there's something called train of four ratio. In the strain of four ratio, or if they give an image based question, like when you, if you see the normal is like this, if this is normal, if you see constant but diminished, and another. So this is constant and diminished response. And this is what happens? This is called as phenomena so when do you see this this is usually seen with depolarizing muscle relaxant that is succinyl choline in phase one block so this phase two block is seen in depolarizing muscle relaxants in phase two block when you give high doses and in conditions of non-depolarizing muscle relaxants so this is a very, very, very important. I want you to yeah, remember this point at any cost. Okay, if they ask you, this is an expected question because uh, as they are more, nowadays they are going more, more and more into the concepts. This is another important question which can occur. So constant but diminished response is seen in succinyl choline in phase one block. There is a normal dose of 0 0.5 to 1 milligrams per kg. And but... In phase two block, that is five to 10, 10 times more doses, that is up to five to 10 mg. If you give in those cases of succinyl choline, you see this, and also in all the non depolarizing muscle relaxants, you see this failed phenomenon. Okay, then during resuscitation, when is the given position indicated? Patient unconscious with pulse and breathing present, unconscious with pulse and breathing absent, unconscious with the pulse present and breathing absent, pulse absent and breathing present. Common sense question What is this position basically? What is this position? Very good. It is a recovery position. The purpose of this recovery position is to prevent the aspiration. To prevent the aspiration, basically. So suppose, just see, when unconscious with pulse is absent and the breath is present, whenever the patient pulse is absent, what will you do? When pulse and breathing are absent, you jump and do the CPR, first of all. After doing the uh, after doing the preliminary steps of um, verifying the scene safety and all, then you do pulse and breathing absent. Then unconscious with pulse present and breathing absent. When pulse present and breathing absent, you give the rescue breaths. Unconscious with pulse absent and breathing present, again you start doing CPR. Okay. So when patient is unconscious with both pulse and breathing present in those conditions to prevent the aspiration, you keep this. Here, I want you to touch upon important points. So, CPR guidelines is a mix of BLS, ACLS, and even they have emphasized white view and recovery that is post cardiac arrest here also has been included in this. So, that is why in the 2020 guidelines, the sixth component recovery has been added. Then, coming to basic life support. Verifying scene safety is important. Then call for help as needed. Then when you do, um, when you start doing the CPR, 
before that, suppose if there is a pulse present, respiration, both breathing and breather present, wait till the help arrives. When pulse is present, respiration is absent, you have to give rescue breaths according to protic islands, it is 10 breaths per minute. It is 10 breaths per minute, the standard. In children, this was a question asked immediately in 2020, they go up to 20 to 30 breaths per minute. Okay, in adults, it is 10 breaths per minute. Remember this case. Then coming to if pulse absent and respiration absent, then you do CPR along with rescue breaths. CPR, you give 100 to 120 per minute, 5 to 6 centimeters deep. Okay, to be very careful. And then 30, 30 is to 2 ratio, you give the rescue breath. So this is very, very, very important case. And then coming to, at this point, remember, what are the rhythms which are shockable rhythms and non-shockable rhythms? Shockable rhythms are, what are the shockable rhythms? Ventricular fibrillation and remember, pulseless ventricular tachycardia. Non-shockable rhythms, non-shockable rhythms are AC stole and pulseless electrical activity. And remember at this point, so once the patient is shifted to advanced cardiac, ACLS, advanced cardiac life uh, restriction, ACLS, advanced cardiac life support, what are the drugs that can be used in shockable rhythms? In shockable rhythms, you can use adrenaline, amiodarone, and lignocaine. And the shock you can use is 200, 120 to 200 joules by basic. Three hundred and sixty joules monophasic. Whereas in non-shockable rhythms like AC stole and pulseless electrical activity, the most common thing you can use is only adrenaline. Okay, and here itself, you remember, please, five H and five T. What are five H and five T? Reversible process of cardiac arrest. What if I hitch? Hypoxia. Come on, guys. Hypolemia. Then hypothermia. H plus ion, that is acidosis. Then hypo or hyperkalemia. What are 5T? Toxins, tension pneumothorax, cardiac tamponade, thrombosis, coronary, thrombosis, pulmonary. So this has to be taken care of. Very, very important. And then another important point is the recent changes of uh, CPR, like mainly most commonly, as you said, like recovery in addition to this in pregnancy, perimortem cesarean section can be performed up to Five minutes. This is a change from four minutes to five minutes. Okay. So this is one of the things which I want you to remember then. Next coming, next question. So this is the recovery position where you keep uh, leg bent to support the position, arm bent to prevent rolling over, hand under the chin to keep the mouth open. Okay, guys. So then yeah, now answer this. Identify the airway maneuver being done. Head tilt and chin lift, two jaw thrust, three head extension. Answer A, one only, B, one and two, C, two and three, D, one, two, three. Come on, guys. Good. See here, this is called as basically a triple maneuver. This triple maneuver where you can see here head tilt, head tilt, 
shield lift and this is a jaw thrust. So this is to make uh, the intubation. And here, remember, whether the head is, so though it is, um, when you have the option of only one and two, here in this condition, it's also being asked like, whether the head is extended or not, just see this, whether head is extended or not. Yes, you are right. Like uh, head till chin lift, jaw thrust is being done. Whether head is extended or not, just type in the chat box. One guess. Come on, everyone answer. It is ideally, if you see, this is the cervical spine. Sorry. This is the cervical spine or neck extension. And for all practical purposes, like if this when I say head extension, it is basically extension of the neck. So in this condition, so if you see the exact option will be head tilt, chin lift and jaw thrust. But again, head extension for all practical purposes can be taken in the neck extension. So one and two and one, two, three, two, both can be answered directly. Depending on this was the question slightly been modified in the examination. Like uh, while the recall is there, in one of the options, the students say head tilt, chin lift, head extension. All the above was one of the thing, but like all of the above is not seen commonly. And head till chin lift jaw thrust is one which is being asked in this condition for all practical purposes. Please try to understand like head extension is basically based on the when you can extend the head or flex the head like based on the neck itself. So consider that. So you can go most commonly with one, two, three in this scenario if at all the scenario arises. Okay, then the instrument shown below is not used for what is the instrument shown here basically. What is the instrument shown below? It is a tracheostomy tube. Tracheostomy tube. Now, apply your common sense until it's used for airway toileting, acute upper airway obstruction, prolonged mechanical ventilation, upper airway examination. Very good. But remember here, like while you are answering this question, don't skip this question of not. It's very important. Like, okay. For airway toilet toileting, airway toileting in the sense, like when you want to do suction, and all these things, you can use this tracheostomy tube. Acute upper airway obstruction, it's a medical emergency, and you have to do uh, the tracheostomy or cricothyroid atomy. Yes. Prolonged mechanical ventilation. Usually, when patients take more than six to seven days of, of one week of ventilation, then you go for tracheostomy. But upper airway examination, you do basically with the help of for examination, you do upper airway, uh, upper airway examination or assessment, you do with the help of laryngoscopy, the direct laryngoscopy or indirect laryngoscopy. Okay. So this is a straightforward question. Okay. So at least in the paper, there will be 25% of the questions, 25% questions where you can just answer, even not knowing much about this, but still uh, looking into this with the common sense, we can answer 25% of the questions in the paper. That is uh, uh, close to 50 questions in the entire paper across the subjects. Uh, you can answer this. Okay. Then, which of the following candle is most commonly used in units? 22 gauge, 24 gauge, 26 gauge, 20 gauge. Most commonly. Question says most commonly. Okay. As much as possible in neonates, though it is like very good. Most of you answer 24 and 26 gauge is most common, are, are most commonly used in units. But if you want to pick up one among this, it is going to be 26 gauge. The reason, like, what I slightly tweaked this question and uh, marked it here, where there's been like multiple options. It is they ask about single thing, go for 26 gauge, and uh, the 24 and 26, though both can be used. And the, the question of canvas is very, very important. Like, 14 gauge, 16 gauge, 18, 14, 16, 18, 20, 22, 24, 26. What is the color of 14 gauge? Orange, gray, green, pink, blue, yellow, purple or violet. What is the maximum flow that can be given? It is roughly, remember, 270, 180, 90, 60, 45, 24, 12, roughly. So maximum flow. And remember, they ask about, like, suppose, what is the color of 17 gauge candela? It is, 17 gauge candela is white in color, though it is not most commonly used, and it is 
up to 135 ml flow will be there. So remember, like one additional thing. If they ask, what is the most commonly used cannula in resuscitation? Suppose in a um, trauma patient, what is the most common cannula used? So usually it is a gray color. Okay. So it is most commonly used for resuscitation. Though technically both 24 and 26 are correct in this, when it's been asked to pick up one among this, then it is 26. See, most of the times, like uh, in, in our entire paper, like when we attempt like 20 to 30 percent of the questions, we'll be having like more than one option correct. That is why, like if you see, they ask you to pick up which is the you have to pick up the best among these. It's not just the correct answer, it is all about the picking up the best option among them, which is very important. Then Anesthesia of choice for cesarean section in a patient with pregnancy induced hypertension. General anesthesia, spinal anesthesia, epidural anesthesia, combined spinal and epidural anesthesia. Come on, guys. See, very good. Here, few of you answered one, few of you answered two, few of you answered three. Like, in fact, like all the three can be correct by slight change in the questions, actually. So usually the anesthesia of choice earlier to say in pregnancy induced hypertension in PAH patients, the ideally what has to be used it is epidural. Why epidural? Because less chances of hypotension when compared with uh, spinal. But with PAH, the epidural has less chance of hypotension. So usually, like ideally, what has to be used? It is epidural has to be used because when the patient will be having the hypertension and suddenly you put it and uh, um, wrap it going into hypotension to prevent this epidural. But in emergencies, if a patient comes for emergencies, when a patient comes for emergencies, so you don't have like that eight to 10 minutes of time to make the patient sit and put an epidural candle on out. So in those conditions, you usually mostly go for the spine. Again, if a patient comes with, PAH patient comes with, or you suspect the patient having seizures, then the answer will be general anesthesia. So in practically all the three can be answered. So in this condition, but in the recent changes, try to um, understand if a question says in an emergency, or you have to understand uh, emergency means then straight away go for spinal anesthesia, but also understand according to the recent things, which even if it is a PAH patient, like as much as possible, try to go for uh, a spinal anesthesia unless until it is, uh, because analgesia is not so important in this uh, condition. Mostly you have to uh, secure the patient and put the baby. So this is very, very, very important question. Like uh, if they ask about like considering in the question, if the seizures are there, so it is like mostly go for a general anesthesia. Though epidural is most commonly used like earlier days for considering the less chance of hypotension. But remember, Spinal anesthesia, according to the recent changes, like though we practically put practical answer, it's spinal anesthesia. So considering even in the recent changes in the guidelines, go ahead with the spinal anesthesia, guess. Okay. Unless until they specifically mention. So if again a common sense question, a 55-year-old male patient with history of CABG four years back and on AC inhibitors is scheduled for hernia surgery. He has good effort tolerance. And which of the following pre-op investigations are ordered? Routine pre-op evaluation plus clinical plus stress testing. Routine pre-op evaluation plus clinical stress testing plus angiography. Routine pre-op evaluation plus clinical evaluation. Routine pre-op evaluation plus clinical plus ventilation perfusion scan. Okay. See. Okay. The routine pre-op evaluation is common among this and clinical evaluation is also common among this. Now the question is being asked whether in addition to clinical evaluation, you're asking about the stress testing, angiography, a VQ scan. Here, history four years back and AZ inhibitors, has good effort tolerance. Good effort tolerance means like when they mention good effort tolerance means like meds, met, metabolic equivalent of task is at least more than four indicates. So in this condition, Again, stress testing that is like uh, do vitamin stress echography is not uh, much needed. Basically, angiography, whether revascularization is not up there or not, it's not needed. And ventilation perfusion scan per se is not needed. In this condition, routine pre-op evaluation plus clinical evaluation is sufficient. All you need, you can do a, you can get a, if not, you need baseline echocardiography. That is 
sufficient basically okay if when they mention the good effort tolerance if they didn't mention about the good effort tolerance then your answer like stress testing would have been correct okay so these are the things like which we can't say um, absolutely okay this one you have to go ahead with this you have to see like based upon the question and assess the answers and answer this question guys what are the clue given if this same question if good effort tolerance was not mentioned then you would be able to go for gone for stress testing is the answer okay then the following capnography indicates bronchospas bronchospasm, spontaneous breath, successful dissociation, esophageal intubation. Very good. It is spontaneous breathings in controlled ventilation. Okay. So this is called as curare cleft. Again, very, very, very important. So this is the normal capnogram. Capnography, you can expect a question for sure. This is controlled ventilation, normal. This is spontaneous ventilation, normal. You should see this characteristic shark fin appearance this is bronchospasm this is a shark fin appearance this is a characteristic mainly seen in bronchospasm it may be seen with airway obstruction let it be that it might be endotracheal tubes or airway obstructive diseases like copd and asthma it is important and another Important thing is, as discussed, curatic left. So spontaneous breathings in controlled ventilation. Here, you also have to remember if it occurs in the middle of the surgery, to give muzzle relaxant. At end of surgery, you give reversal agent. That is as simple as that. Then, this is called as flatline capnogram. Seen in esophageal intubation. Cardiac arrest. Accidental extubation and circuit disconnection. And circuit disconnection. And remember this, guys. When you see two capnographs like this, or if they say they give only one saying this rapid increase in this. This indicates success ROSC return of spontaneous circulation. ROSC. Okay. Then if you see waveforms like this. So here you see slow decrease, rapid decrease, slow increase, rapid increase. So slow decrease is seen in conditions of hyperventilation. Slow increase is seen in hypoventilation. Rapid decrease is seen in embolism, pulmonary or fat or air embolism. Rapid increase is seen in malignant hyperthermia. 
Okay. So these are the things which I want you to remember. And there's another few things, though it is not mean most commonly asked. It is These are called as cardiogenic oscillations seen in children and those in with thin chest wall. So these are the conditions I want you to remember uh, very much. And when does this ETCO2 increase? ETCO2 increase in all those conditions where metabolism increases. ETCO2 decreases in those conditions where metabolism decreases. So based on this, you can understand and assess and uh, see. Cardiogenic oscillations is seen in children and those in with Thin chest wall. Okay. This is all about capnography. Very, very, very important. Yes. And who introduced capnography? This was again, again a question way back was asked in uh, 2016. It's Bethune and Brecken. Bethune and Brecken. Okay. Now, coming to the next question. What is the agent of choice for decreasing the incidence of hallucinations after induction with ketamine? Morphine, Medazolam, Propofol, Thiopentum. Come on, guys, answer this. Straightforward question. So, ketamine is the agent like which cause hallucinations, and you know, ketamine it causes dissociative anesthesia. And the incidence of these hallucinations decrease with age. And usually, you give the benzodiazepines beans to decrease the incidence. Here, metazolam is the agent like which can be used. So they, they are not giving straightforwardly what exactly is this. The agent of choice for decreasing the incidence of hallucinations after induction with ketamine is metazolam, the benzodiazepines. beans. Okay. Then, which of the following is most commonly used for cardiac surgery? Propofol, thiopentone, ketamine, and etomidate. Very good. When the question is very specific for cardiac surgeons, mostly used is this. They are asking about most cardio-stable drug. The most cardio-stable drug is etomidate. Propofol causes hypotension and bradyarrhythmia. Thiopentone causes hypo plus compensatory tachy. Ketamine cause hypertension and tachy, but etomidate is most cardio stable. Similarly, now tell me what is the IV induction agent of choice for cardio um, IV induction agent of choice for cardiac surgeries? We know it is etomidate. What is the inhalational agent? It is isoflurane. Then coming to what is the agent for muscle relaxant? It is Vecuronia. Then opioid usually use fentanyl group of drugs. Okay. So this is how you can expect a question like uh, rather than asking being asked a single um, point like usually um, they may ask about all the four combinedly or at least three things combinedly which is the IV inhalational muscle relaxation which is the correct combination of drugs that can be used. Now tell me. If the same question, uh, similar question, which of the following agents like uh, can be used for um, neurosurgeries? Neurosurgeries like for IV, when I say IV for neurosurgeries, for IV, you can't use ketamine. You can use either thio or propofol. Inhalational, again, choose isoflurane. Muzzle relaxant, you can choose VEC or Cisatracurium, Atracurium, anything. Okay. So, while picking up the answer, like see where the clue will be with the isoflurane, wherever whichever options will be having the isoflurane, go ahead with those things. Okay. That is how we have to answer and evaluate, like eliminate the options and uh, go to the nearest correct option. Okay. So, these are the things which I want you to uh, remember. And then, any additional things I want to remember like this. So one met score, metabolic equivalent of task score. Metabolic equivalent of task score, anything more than four 
is good. Less than four indicates the operative duties. Very operative duties. And remember how to calculate 3.5 ml per kg per minute is what we have to remember. Okay, we need to oxygen consumption is for one minutes. Okay, this is one important point which you have to remember. Then coming to ASA monitoring. AS, sorry, ASA physical status classification. Remember six grades, one, two, three, four, five, six. Six, you know, head is a brain dead patient. One is normal. With no so a minimal alcohol use, no smoking and all. Two is patient with mild systemic disease. Two is sorry, three is severe systemic disease. Four is severe systemic disease with constant threat to life. Five is a moribund patient is not expected to survive without surgery. Okay. So here's a physical classification, just go through the, the various examples and all. This is going to be very, very important. Then coming to the fasting guidelines. Okay, for in adults, fluid cities, liquid cities. So basically it is two, that is water, clear fluids, two hours, semi-solids, four hours, solids, light meal, six hours, fatty meal, eight hours. When it comes to children, it is again two hours for clear fluids, but in the options, if it is say one hour, according to the recent guidelines, you have to go with one hour. Then breast milk is important. It is four hours, formula milk, six hours. Okay. Then what else I want you to remember? Go once through the oxygen, sorry, the cylinders, their colors, pin index. Go through this once, mainly like the oxygen cylinder, which has black body with white shoulder, Pin index two five. So these are things which I want you to remember the color coding and all. Then you know maples and circuits only like a couple of points. The best circuit used for spontaneous ventilation in adults is uh, A, and controlled ventilation is D. Bain circuit, which is the coaxial circuit. Then soda line, which is a CO2 absorber, and uh, it is the indicator is titanium low 14 to 20. Airway, airway and equipment, though we are we are going to use the uh, use the images. Remember about this oxygen delivery devices, very, very, very important. Face mask, simple face mask, Hudson mask, uh, Venturi mask, um, national cannula, non debriefing mask, and HFNC, very important. Then also, also go through the LMA, laryngeal mask airway, various sizes, the eight sizes, like 1, 1.5, 2, 2.5, Three, four, five, six, less than five kilos, six to 10, 11 to 20, 21 to 30, 31 to 50, 51 to 70, 71 to 100, more than 100. This is the weight group use. If at all, like they ask, like, uh, what is the maximum weight that can be inflated? Like, uh, till now, there's been an I've asked 4, 7, 10, 14, 20, 30, 40, 50. And you know, like, we, is there in our workbooks and also VSV, what is the first generation? This is all like LMA Classic, which has one port. Second generation has two ports, which has been recently asked in the INSC examination. LMA Prosil, which is already there in your, in your books. Also remember when we are when you go through that, uh, that page, LMA Prosil, you also go through the additional couple of points, like the images, what we are given for IGEL also, okay? IGEL and Android. So then in addition to this, then coming to monitoring, monitoring chapter the most important thing is capnography which you know then pulse oximeter readings which are not affecting um the, uh, the situations where the pulse oximeter readings are not affected is also very important then another important concept is bispectral index bis remember one point the ideal this is a, this is there in your workbooks guys i'm just like trying to revise quickly what are the other important points which can fetch you 
Okay, bispectral index score, which is adequate for anesthesia, is 40 to 60, which is very important. How you can identify on the face, if you can see four leads. If at all, in presence of four leads, if they give only three leads, remember it is for entropy. It is an entropy. Okay, these are the things I want to remember. Then coming to IV induction agents, you know, uh, thiopentone, propofol, ketamine, etomidate, the table which we have given in the workbook is uh, more than sufficient. And uh, which are the things, who, mostly they ask about questions like which are uh, most commonly used in per cardiac surgeries, neurosurgeries, um, respiratory surgeries and all. For this, the 13th chapter in your workbook, like which says, uh, just go through that chapter once. Mm -hmm. It's six pages and uh, it hardly takes like 10 minutes. Um, for where we have consolidated like cardiac surgeries, neurosurgeries, respiratory surgeries, obstetric surgeries, then uh, eye surgeries. Uh, and remember when I say eye surgeries, oculocardiac reflex is very important. Once in this oculocardiac reflex, you have to re remove the stimulus like that automatically, like where when you are operating or touching up the medial rectus where the bradycardiac is and um, you immediately remove it. Okay, this is one thing so you immediately ask the surgeon to remove this, or uh, you just uh, then it will go back to its regular thing. So, these are the things which I want you to remember. Then, among inhalational agents, three drugs which I want you to remember is isoferrin, sevoferrin, desferrin. Read everything about these things, like it takes like uh, two to three minutes. Then, muscle relaxants, vacuronium, atracurium, cisatracurium, and another very, very important is sugamadex which has been also asked in the recent things which I keep saying in the class. So it is the one of the recent, uh, recent in a sense, like uh, two decades, it used to reverse rocuronium, selective gamma cyclodextrin, selective binding agent. Okay, gamma dex has high affinity for rocuronium, very, very, very important. Okay, this is one thing. And also read about like vicuronium, atracurium, cisatracurium. Both atra and cisatra are like mostly Hoffman's elimination of lots. Okay, and um, then um, coming to uh, opioids, like one important point, which is naloxone, which is used for uh, the reversal. And fentanyl is the most cardio uh, stable, like which we use, and remifentanyl use it for daycare surgeries. Then coming to local anesthetic drugs, the local anesthetic systemic toxicity, which we discussed, is very, very, very important. And usually when you give the adrenaline um, along with this, for if you use one inch to two lakh concentrations, in one of the examinations, instead of one inch to two lakh, they had given one inch to one lakh, one inch to ten thousand, one inch to thousand, one inch to ten. In those conditions, the answer will be one inch to one lakh. Usually, the correct answer is one inch to two lakhs. Okay, this is one of the questions asked when you use local anesthetic with adrenaline. Local anesthetic along with phenylephrine is usually one inch to twenty thousand. Okay, these are the things. Local anesthetic systemic toxicity. Um, Bupropion is the most cardiotoxic drugs and uh, the various formulations. And uh, what is the maximum safe dose of lignocaine without adrenaline? And for adrenaline, the correct answer is 1 is to 2 lakhs. But in the options, if they say 1 is to 1 lakh, 10,000, 1,000, 10, then go for 1 is to 1 lakh. Okay, then maximum safe dose of lignocaine without adrenaline and with adrenaline, maximum safe dose of bupropion without adrenaline and uh, with adrenaline, just go through that. Then coming to um, the regional anesthesia chapter, what I want is again the image based questions like tumescent anesthesia, this, when it comes to stellate ganglion block, lumbar plexus block. So all the images, like though you won't, you won't go and read about most common things, but uh, the images which I have there in the workbook, like go through that, though we are going to give, or at least go through the VSV, where you can just have a glance of the, the images. And then we have discussed about the spinal anesthesia, postural puncture headache, then epidural, what are the structures, peers, and all. Those, those are the things I want to remember. Then the 13th chapter, like uh, what are the anesthetic drugs which are used in various surgeries is very, very important. Then daycare surgeries, you know, what are, when I say daycare, surgeries the iv induction agent of choice is propofol inhalation is this in children it is going to be co muscle relaxant mevacurium opioid remy fentanyl or fentanyl group of drugs then benzodiazepine it is remy mijolum so these are for uh, decade surgeries and two important scores like which you are, I want you to remember is 
for decade surgeries the most common is all red score and post anesthesia discharge scoring system in these things the score should be more than or equal to 9 these are the thing only things i want you to remember okay then we discussed about the malignant hypothermia and also the iv cannulas which are very important and in addition to this the another important thing where when it comes to cpr we had discussed about the important points like which are very common and the recent changes mainly the respiratory rate in children like 20 to 30 is very important which was asked earlier and then the only drug of mention in bls guidelines is um, then coming to mechanical ventilation chapter, like um, remember all the things about SIMV synchronized instrumental mandatory ventilation. Okay, uh, then um, SIMV uh, uh, and another important thing I want to remember is what are the weaning modes of ventilation? Weaning modes of ventilation. It is SIMV, regular support or CPAP ventilation. Okay. So these are the things I want you to remember this. Okay. So try to um, this is all about uh, anesthesia and like we are expecting like five to six questions and uh, each and every question I'm pretty confident that you are going to answer for sure. So just take few extra seconds like whenever even if the question looks so easy and all like spend few extra seconds and you will get the answer correct. Yes. Okay. That's all. And if there are any doubts like uh, please feel free to uh, uh, reach out to me. Okay. Like any other things like can any more doubts? You have you have my number. You can yeah. Uh, someone asked about MLI. MLI is eutectic mixture of local anesthetic where you have like uh, two point five percent prilocaine and two point five percent lignocaine. Usually MLI is used for uh, IV cannulations and uh, to prevent intraoperative uh, the kids the, the anxiety and. Uh, one other important thing is the, it can be used only for um, topically, but it can't be used in broken skin or mucous membranes. Okay. Local and stick plus phenyl is 1 is to 20,000. Yeah, we will be uploading this in the app, and also you will be having uh, the notes with you guys. Okay. Okay. Guys, thank you. If anything is there, please reach out to me and uh, message. I'll uh, explain to you. Okay, guys. Thank you. Have a great day.